the uh, tumor uh, lecture uh, for lung tumors. So in the last lecture, we talked about uh, like normal anatomy histology, a kind of a few uh, precursor lesions for cancers and so forth. We briefly talked about this stuff in the last lecture too. So I'm gonna finish up the lung tumors today and then next lectures we'll do the uh, two hours of introductory kind of interest lung disease lecture. So as you know, uh, lung cancers are, you know, broadly uh, divided into small cell versus small, small cell. You know, it's important because small cell carcinomas usually are not surgical candidates, you know. You know, rarely, yeah, you know, if there's a very limited small cell, they may do surgery, but usually for more questions and stuff like that, small cell carcinomas patients are not surgical candidates, right? So, uh, at the, you know, 40% of uh, all lung cancers are small cell carcinomas. Um, and then after all small cell carcinomas, um, adenocarcinoma are more common than squamous cell carcinoma. And there's mixed tumors and the large cell carcinoma and so forth. We don't make the diagnosis of large cell carcinoma too often these days because we don't try to like, you know, subclassify it with you, you know, using our immunostains and so forth. But the reason why small cell carcinoma is uh, deadly is because about 80% of the time, at the time of diagnosis, uh, patients have a metastatic disease to elsewhere. And um, as you know, uh, you know, lung cancers, uh, easily go to the brain, a lot of times to adrenal glands, right? You do a you know, CT workup patients with lung cancers, and a lot of times you'll see a mass in the adrenal gland. And whether this adrenal adenoma or, or a carcinoma, you need to do biopsies, right? So small cell carcinomas almost um, a lot of times have a metastatic uh, disease at the time of diagnosis, high initial response to chemo, and uh, small cell carcinomas almost 100% smoker, almost 100%. If I make a diagnosis of small cell carcinoma, I make sure this patient is a smoker and are exposed to smoke. You know, if you see a patient with small cell carcinoma living 20 years, 30 years, there's something wrong with the diagnosis. Non-small cell carcinoma, almost, uh, well, less metastatic as compared to small cell carcinoma. 50% of the time, I, I, the patients can have a metastatic disease. This response to chemo. Squamous cell carcinoma, of the small non-small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma are almost 100% smoking related. So when it comes to non-small cell carcinoma, the main types you need to know for your boards are squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, and carcinoid tumors. Uh, you'll come across like a non-small cell carcinoma or a large cell carcinoma sometimes. Um, adenosquamous carcinoma, we see that quite often. Uh, carcinoma with sarcomatoid elements or so-called um, carcinoma or some of these sarcomatoid carcinoma and so forth. Uh, this look, they look like sarcoma, but they're actually are carcinomas. There are rare tumors that are carcinoma of salivary gland type. I don't think anybody will ever question you on that. But you need to know your squamous cell adenocarcinomas and carcinoid tumors. Note that carcinoid tumor is a neuroendocrine tumor, right? It's a neuroendocrine tumor. Yet, this is a non small cell carcinoma. Non -small cell. Same thing with large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, right? If it's a large neuroendocrine cell carcinoma, although this is a neuroendocrine cell carcinoma, behaves like a small cell carcinoma, classified under non small cell carcinoma, not that, you know. Squamous carcinoma, most common in men in the Western world, smoking, almost all of them are smoking with it. You don't, if you have a plural fusion patient with squamous carcinoma, you really don't see positive malignant plural flow. When is the last time you saw positive malignant fluid in squamous carcinoma? Not often. That's a small cell or any carcinomas. Traditionally, it's centrally located, you can also see in the periphery. Sometimes these patients with squamous cell carcinoma can have a, you know, so-called paraneuroplastic syndromes. Sometimes hypercalcemia, this can be a more question, you know. Patients with squamous cell carcinoma can have a hypercalcemia. Uh, there's high incidence of a PA53 mutations. There's subtype of uh, squamous cell carcinomas. As fellows, uh, somebody might preach you on this. Please note that this is squamous cell carcinoma. You can have a basaloid variant of squamous cell carcinoma. You can have a small cell variant of Squamous cell carcinoma. These are squamous cell carcinoma. These are not small cell carcinomas. Why is this important? Because they behave like a squamous cell carcinoma. All right. When you have a basaloid or small cell variant of uh, squamous cell carcinoma, these are more aggressive than sort of garden variety squamous cell carcinoma. All right. So if you have a patient, if you get a diagnosis of small cell variant of squamous cell carcinoma, this is much worse than a typical squamous cell carcinoma. Any questions? Don't confuse that with small cell carcinoma. We're talking about a variant of a squamous cell carcinoma, right? So if you have a basaloid variant of a squamous cell carcinoma, be careful, all right? For pathology-wise, if you don't think of these variants of squamous cell carcinoma, then 
sometimes can, you can confuse these for squam, you know, small cell carcinomas. You don't want to do that. You can have a papillary variant of squamous carcinoma too. So the well differential squamous carcinomas will have keratin formation, right? Keratin pearls. You can have intercellular breathing, so called desmosomes. These are the interconnected, you know, breathing or intercellular breathing. Uh, whereas in poorly differential squamous carcinoma, you don't see these features a lot of times. And then you need to rely on immunohistochemistry, chemistry, ISC. So for the squamous carcinoma, we mentioned before, P43, P63, CK56, and also uh, P40 is a good marker for squamous carcinoma. As you can see, squamous carcinoma is more centrally located. There's a large area of necrosis. <clears throat> Sometimes in squamous carcinoma, you see these tumors growing very fast. You see these tumors growing very fast. So sometimes you can see a lot of necrosis in the center of the tumor. You may be following a patient away with a tumor in long nodule for two years, three years, very slowly growing, millimeters at a time. What kind of tumors do you think these are? More like adenocarcinomas, right? Adenocarcinomas grow very slowly sometimes. You can see patients can present with a brand meds or like you know, ataxia, you know, you know, problems with speaking, so forth, language difficulties. You do a CT scan of it, you'll see a tumor or multiple lesions. You think metastatic disease, a lot of times these are coming from the lungs, the adenocarcinomas, not a squamous cell, not the small uh, or small cell. If they show you a, a slide of cytology, you know, squamous cell carcinoma, when you see pink like that, these are keratinizing cells, keratinizing cells. These cells look like tadpole like cells. These cells are like tadpole, long processes. Look at the reference cells in the background, these are uh, neutrophils. We got the nucleus here. This nucleus is very large, high NC ratio, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, very little cytoplasm, a lot of nucleus. Look at the nuclear contour, kind of bilobed, irregular nuclear contour, how dark this is. So this is dark, uh, irregular nuclear contour, large high NC ratios, sometimes mitotic figures, these are squamous and carcinomas. If I have this in cytology, on bronchioles, brushing, or so forth, I call this squamous cell carcinoma just based on this much. In uh, histology, you see, you know, like a keratin pearls. I'll show you another one. I don't have one here. So you'll see some keratin pearls for keratin in a nest of tumor cells. And the so called intercellular breathing, these are desmosomes between the cells. Desmosomes, these are confined to the squamous cells. For the squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharyngeal area, uh, or the lung, or the genital urinary, you know, areas. Alvar, you know, Pina, all those lesions will have an uh, intercellular breathing, you know, well differential carcinomas. So there are several chromosome deletions in patients with uh, squamous cell carcinomas. There's also amplifications in FGFR1 gene. Mm -hmm. So that's a few words to squamous cell carcinoma. Next common tumor is adenocarcinomas. Note that a significant number of these patients can be non smokers. If they give you a question on the board, say, a uh, female of Asian ancestry or from Japan or something, non-smoker, has a lung cancer, think of adenocarcinoma, think of adenocarcinoma, and think of doing EGFR, you know, studies on this patient. Um, when we have adenocarcinoma, 75% of patients with adenocarcinoma are smokers, 25% can be non-smokers. Whereas squamous carcinoma, almost all of them are smokers. Adenocarcinoma can be peripheral per located, it can be smaller. I've seen cases of patients where They've been following a long nodule, you know, the long is like, you know, one centimeter nodule, next year is like a 1.2 centimeter nodule, do a biopsy to start the adenocarcinoma. That's kind of typical finding of adenocarcinoma. Know your subtypes of adenocarcinoma, all right, subtypes. Adenocarcinoma in situ, what's the definition of adenocarcinoma in situ? You need to know this, it's, it's more questions. It has to be less than three centimeters in size, all right? Non-invasive carcinoma, non-invasive carcinoma. So in other words, these tumor cells are lining the airspace or airways, but they're not invading into the stroma. They're not invading into this, you know, vascular, you know, our vessels or lymphatics, or there's no distant metastases. These are, these are so-called adenocarcinoma in situ. What's the minimum size requirement for adenocarcinoma in situ? But five millimeters. Less than five millimeters, you call it atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. Less than five millimeters or less than half centimeter, you call it Atypical adenomatous hyperplasia. More than that, and up to three centimeters, we call adenocarcinoma in situ. All right. We also have adenocarcinoma, microinvasive adenocarcinoma. What are these? These are just like adenocarcinoma in situ, but invasion is less than five millimeters. 
the invasion that's of five millimeters. So these are micro-invasive adenocarcinomas. So this thing came around 2011, 2012 in the paper. So why is this important? Why is this important? Because patients with adenocarcinoma in situ are minimally invasive adenocarcinomas do very well. Their peripheral locator lesion, you do a lobectomy with clear margin, the patients will almost have a normal lifespan. That's why this diagnosis is important. Note that if you're dealing with older, you know, pulmonologists and so forth, they'll talk about bronchial alveolar adenocarcinomas, bronchial alveolar type. So this is so-called adenocarcinoma situ. That is a new term. So don't use the term bronchial alveolar carcinoma. Older textbooks still have it. Adenocarcinoma can have an asner pattern, forming glands, asner. Lipidic pattern, I'll show you examples of lipidic pattern. This is board questions. Lipid pattern is nothing but like a butterflies or birds sitting in the wire. That's a lipid pattern. Papillary carcinoma, carcinoma, solid mucin forming, and so forth. This is a gross picture of uh, adenocarcinoma and the periphery of the lung. You can see your traction of the lung parenchyma. This is a tumor. And adenocarcinoma, by definition, as you know, forms glands, right? So that's not forming. This is asner adenocarcinoma. Um, again, adenocarcinoma, forming glands, asner adenocarcinomas. The marker for adenocarcinoma, if it is forming glands in obvious adenocarcinomas, yeah, you don't need to do stains. But if not forming glands, sheets of tumor cells, you do a TTF1, which is an adenocarcinoma marker for the lung. If it stains positive, then it's not much a carcinoma consistent with adenocarcinoma. Consistent with adenocarcinomas. Now, the thing about uh, adenocarcinoma is metastatic disease. You have a metastatic disease to the brain and has adenocarcinoma. How do you tell this from the lung or from the other areas? So if this is TTF1 positive, most likely a lung. TTF can be positive in one other area, that's a thyroid. TTF1 stands for thyroid transcription factor of 1. So it can be also positive in thyroid. So how do we know this is thyroid versus lung? We can do thyroid globally, thyroid globally. Thyroid globally is positive in thyroid tumors, whereas it's negative in um, you know, lung cancers. So if you have a different diagnosis, if you have a you know, metastatic disease to the brain, and your TTF most likely in lung cancer, OK? So endocarcinoma in situ, in terminal bronchial alveolar reasons, 1% to 9% of all lung cancers. You can have single or multiple uh, nodules. They can call this, we can like a, almost pneumonia-like things. If, if a differential diagnosis is malignant versus pneumonia, most likely you're talking about that person in situ. You know, we've seen cases, we even wrote papers from one of the fellows in the past where it looks like a pneumonia, diffuse pneumonia in a bronchial alveolar carcinoma. So you always think, you know, have that in a different diagnosis. If you treatment, you know, treat the patients with antibiotics and the pneumonia doesn't go away, think of adenocarcinoma in situ or adenocarcinoma with a little bit of a pattern as different diagnosis. So this is what's so called a lipid growth pattern. So you can see that on the, you know, uh, at the top part of the slide, this is what normal look, uh, lung looks like. The alveolar septa very thin. This is tumor in the lower part. You can see these tumor cells lining the alveolar septa. They're lining the alveolar septa. By definition, there is no invasion into the stroma. There is no invasion in the vascular space. There is no invasion in the lymph nodes and so forth. This is so-called adenocarcinoma in situ. So this pattern of growth is called lipid growth pattern, lipid growth pattern. So lipid growth pattern uh, or adenocarcinoma in situ have two distinguished pathology. One's a mucinous type, one's a non-mucinous type. This is a non-mucinous type right here, columnar cells lining this uh, alveolar septa. This is a mucinous type. See, there's mucin, like clearing in the cytoplasm. So why is this important? Because mucinous type is much worse than non-mucinous type. Non-mucinous type of adenocarcinoma in situ you know, do much better than mucinous type. Mucinous type is very rare. You don't, make, you don't want to make that diagnosis too often. Any questions? The reason about mucinous type is it spreads from one airspace to the other. So it's, it's hard to get a clear margin. You'll have a widespread disease when it comes to mucinous adenocarcinoma in situ. Remember definition of adenocarcinoma in situ, three centimeters. If it's more than three centimeters, then you're going to call you know, adenocarcinoma more with a little bit of a pattern. Oh, you mentioned the lipidic pattern. Could you just describe that on the, like, you said it looked like birds or something? It's like, a, you know, um, birds sitting in the wire. If the wire is an alveolar septa right here, is the alveolar septa, the tumor oh, cells are lining this. Okay. That's what the. How much differentiate between the small cell variant of squamous carcinoma versus small cell cancer? 
Well, uh, that, you really can sometimes. So what you need sometimes, you know, a small cell variant of squamous carcinoma, you may see some squamous differentiation in the background, other areas. The other thing is immunostain. Immunostains with a you know, small cell stands for, you know, P63, P40, CG56, you know, those stands for, you know, squamous markers. Whereas a small cell variant smell, you know, our small cell neurogen tumor stands for CD56, synaptophagin, chromogranin, and so forth. Is that good? So immunostain is really important for pathology, for a pathologist. If you don't have a differential diagnosis, sometimes, you know, you throw P63 and, a, you know, and a CD56 or synaptophagin, then you can tell the difference. And also TTF1 can be positive in small cell. Uh, and you're in small cell. So when you have adenocarcinoma, it's PD-L1 is important, right? This is not a PD-L1 PD is impor important. And then EGFR, ALK, ROS, MET, and the TARS and kinase inhibitors, right? If there's mutations, then you can hit TARS, and so forth, right? Or TARS and kinase inhibitors. And in patients so without TARS and kinase and gene mutation, KRAS. KRAS is also in smokers versus EGFR non smokers. So KRAS have mutation usually in adenocarcinoma. Smokers are 30%, non smokers 5%. And EGFR mutations usually non smokers. So, large cell carcinoma, we don't make this diagnosis too often because we have tools to kind of differentiate tumors. Sometimes I just call it non small cell carcinoma because the tools really don't help us. Um, it says, uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent, but you know, that number is pretty low. So, the large cell carcinoma, is, you know, in histology, it doesn't look like a small cell or it doesn't look like a squamous cell or any carcinoma. Those tumors usually were called large cell. This is a mixed tumor, squamous cell and adenocarcinomas. This is one a patient I had. Adenocarcinoma, clear, clearly forming glands here. This is squamous tumor. So if I were to do TTF1 and P63, P63 would be positive here, T21 would be positive. So, so much for non smooth carcinoma. I just want to like, cover that real quick. Now let's go into neuroendocrine tumors, right? Neuroendocrine tumors. This is a way of, you know, like a differentiating tumors. This all arise from neuroendocrine cells, right? We, see, we have normal neuroendocrine cells in the bronchial tree, right? So these tumors arise from neuroendocrine cells. Are neuroendocrine tumors just confined to the lungs? No. You can see neuroendocrine cells pretty much anywhere, right? You can see neuroendocrine cells in, in the GI system, like carcinoid tumors, is a, is a, you know, neuroendocrine tumor cells. You can see in, in the pancreas. You can see in a bladder, you know, in your bladder. You can see prostate, small cell carcinoma of the prostate, you know, just like the small cell of the you know, lung. What's a tumor in the skin that looks like a small cell? What do you call that? Any, any answers? Have you heard of Merkel cell? Yeah. Merkel cell is just like a small cell in the skin. Like a, almost like a small cell, it's a neurogen tumor. It's, it's like a pre, you know, pre, pre a vicious tumor. It's, it's not a good tumor, bad tumor. So uh, polymer neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia, you see that quite often. You know, in tumor heads, the size is important. Remember I give you a uh, point of five centimeters or five millimeters, three things. One is like a benign tumorlets, less than five millimeters in size. Carcinoma in situ versus uh, atypical adenomatous hyperplasia, five millimeters in size. Uh, Minimal invasive, five millimeters. So it's just like a small, five millimeters small size. So they use that size. So five millimeters, you know that, three things. So you can have a benign tumorlet. These are small tumorlets, less than five, five millimeters in size. Carcinoid tumors, I'll tell you how to diagnose carcinoid tumors, atypical carcinoid tumors, and high grade neurogen carcinomas, right? High grade neurogen carcinomas. If you would like to define neurogen carcinomas as a low grade or high grade, the low grade would be like in the carcinoid tumors, and the high grade would be like the large cell neurogen carcinoma or small cell carcinoma. Okay? In the spectrum. What's the difference between here, the high grade small cell carcinoma and the other small cell carcinoma? The same thing. This is the small cell we're talking about. When you have a small cell carcinoma of the lung, this is what we're talking about. It's like I show you a neuroendocrine cell tumor. It's a tumor so that uh, you know the, the origin of the tumors are neuroendocrine cells, right? So if you hear the term in the rounds and stuff like that, patient has a small cell carcinoma. This is a small cell carcinoma you're talking about. Um, but if you're talking about small cell variant of squamous cell carcinoma, that, that's a squamous cell carcinoma. That's not a small cell. Yeah. That's you know. It's actually, you know, classified as a non small cell carcinoma. And the carcinoma in the lungs, does it look like small cell carcinoma? 
we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that. And I'll tell you the difference, how to differentiate carcinoid from atypical carcinoid from a small cell, all right? Large cell neurocon tumor, you need to know that too. That behaves like a small cell carcinoma, right? Large cell neurocon tumor, large cell neurocon tumor, that behaves like a small cell carcinoma. Very aggressive tumor. If you have a patient with a large cell neurocon tumor, it's a very aggressive, high grade neurocon cell tumor. That's right under large cell carcinoma. So it's very confusing. So just as a fellow, you need to know this, kind of make sure you are, you can just go over it and over it. If you have any questions, you can always ask me. So, so you have a benign tumorlet, benign tumorlet, and you have carcinoid, atypical carcinoid, and the small cell and large cell carcinoma. So carcinoid and above are malignant tumors, and benign tumorlets are called benign tumors. If you have three millimeter lesion that looks like a carcinoid, that's a tumor, a benign tumor, that's benign cancer. You don't give that cancer. So if it is six millimeters and I see the same tumor, that's a cancer in patient. So the strictly in size. Books talk about like the cytology cytomorphology, but it's, it's not that. So tumor size is important. Mitotic figure is important, right? In, in carcinoid tumors, there's very few mitotic figures. So I'll give you a number. In a small cell carcinoma or a typical carcinoma, there's larger, you know, like the mitotic figures are much higher. Necrosis. There's more necrosis in a small cell carcinoma compared to carcinoid tumor. To answer your question, two, two main things for me as a pathologist to differentiate a small cell from a carcinoid is mitotic figures and necrosis. You have a lot of necrosis, more than 10 mitosis for 10 high power field. So I look at 10 fields in the microscope. If I see 10 mitosis, more than 10 mitosis, that's small cell. If it's between 2 to 10 mitosis, that's um, atypical carcinoma. Less than 10, uh, 2 mitosis or 10 high power field, very few mitosis, then that's a carcinoma. In carcinoma, there's no necrosis. So let's talk about small cell carcinoma. This is under neuroendocrine tumors. Small cell carcinomas, almost all of them are smokers. If you see a patient 20 years later who has a small cell carcinoma, unlikely this patient has a small cell carcinoma. Five year survival patients with small cell is about 10 to 15%. Deadly tumor, right? We have both said. So you don't, so if the board you say, you know, they give you a diagnosis of small cell carcinoma, or they'll give you like histology and say, synaptophysian, chromogranin positive, ks 6 7 very high, and so on and so forth. Patient is a smoker. Uh, what's the next step? And they say surgery, don't pick that, <laughs> don't pick surgery. You know, so, you know, send him to uh, the colleges, all right? Uh, you know, so it's uh, incurable by surgical means. Uh, so there's a, there really isn't a variant of small cell carcinoma. There's no, you know, it's a small cell in your neurocon tumor. There's no variant. You can have a small cell with other tumors mixed with it. I've had those. You have adenocarcinoma and small cell in the same tumor sometimes. Yeah, I've had those. So. Uh, other than that, there's no uh, variance of small cell carcinoma. These cells are very small. They're about two to three si times the size of lymphocytes. Scan the cytoplasm, ill-defined cell borders. Salt and pepper chromatin, they'll use that all the time. So called granular chromatin. Absent nucleoli, not nuclei, nucleoli. There's no nucleoli. In a squamous cell and adenocarcinoma, I can see large nucleoli within the nucleus. You can see nuclear molding. What's a molding? One nucleus hugging the other nucleus. One nucleus is hugging the other nucleus. Nucleus is hugging the other nucleus. That's mold. I'll show you a picture. Crush artifact means these cells break very easily. They're crushed. At the time of processing of the cytosis site, they crush easily as cytosis site. High mitosis, a lot of mitotic figures in their cell necrosis. It's a party phenomena or it's a party effect. It's what happens is these cells break and the DNA line the vessels. These are called is a party effect. I'll show you a picture. This is a patient with a small cell carcinoma, and before and after six weeks of chemo, that's a small cell carcinoma. Usually, small cell carcinoma in the high area. And then you can see after six weeks, it's pretty much gone, but these things are really not gone. You know, They come back and kill you. This is what a small cell carcinoma looks like. This is what a saw looks like. A lot of crushed, all these like elongated blue processes, those are nuclear processes. they crushed. And molding is like that. See that right there? That's molding. One nucleus is hugging the other nucleus. There, there, that's molding. And, and chromatin is very, you know, granular chromatin, salt and pepper chromatin. So these are salt and pepper chromatin. This is one high power field. One high power field. Look at how many mitotic figures. One, two, three, four, five. So there's five mitotic figures in one field. So if there's more than 10 in 10 fields, there's small cell carcinoma. So clearly in one field, there's five here. 
So this is a classic case of a small cell carcinoma. This is so-called is a body phenomena. Uh, this DNA materials lining the vessels is a body phenomena. So in this slide, you can also see a lot of necrosis in the background, a lot of necrosis in the background. So in electron microscopy, we don't use EM anymore. Uh, EM is mainly used in like you now some viral stuff. And in a renal pathology, they use EM you know, for photocytes and also some else. So they don't use uh, EM anymore, but you see dense core nucleus sector granules. And the small cell carcinoma stand for neuroendocrine markers. The good neuroendocrine markers are CD56 synaprophysic chromogranin. These are good markers. They can ask you any words. And these are the granules with the neurosexual granules. And you know, there's lots of functions involved in P53 genes, RB genes, chromosome 3P deletions, and so forth. And there's amplification of family genes. So any questions, small cell carcinoma? Small cell or non-small cell? You usually hear this term all the time in your rounds. Patient has small cell carcinoma, non small cell carcinoma. So you know what you're talking about. Carcinoma tumor is in the lower spectrum of neuroendocrine tumors. These tumors arise from neuroendocrine cells, right? You have normally, you have normal, you know, neuroendocrine cells in your airways. And it's one to 5% of lung tumors. You know, a lot of times you see in younger patients uh, and significant number of these patients are non-smokers, uh, but carcinoma tumors are not too common. You don't see too often, about two, three to four centimeters in size. More organoid panelithic like organisms and has a rounded and uniform nuclei, moderate cytoplasm, typically no mitosis, very few mitotic figures, less than two mitosis for 10 high power field and no necrosis. Whereas atypical carcinoma tumors have, uh, you know, 10 to 40% uh, have P53 mutations, two to 10 mitosis for 10 high power field, and it can have a little bit of uh, necrosis, a little bit of mitosis. There was a case, there was a legal case in Charles area. The pathologist sued because Something to do with atypical carcinoid versus the carcinoid. And um, so, you know, uh, patients find, you know, people find the reasons to sue you. So, uh, you know, you can worry about, you know, it's after the best you can to treat the patients. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what to say. So, this is a typical carcinoid in the airway. This is in the bronchus. So, there's a little uh, little lesion right there in the, in the bronchiolar uh, lesion. And this kind of organoid, like in a kind of form, uh, forming a little pattern here, like nesting pattern like that. And these, uh, by definition, don't have any mitotic figures, and there's no necrosis. And these are usually, you know, more than, you know, five millimeters in size. Little cubital uh, cells, a uh, little palisading pattern right here. And this is a case I had with the patient. This is a, this is a kind of high power view. So this is about two millimeters under scope. So this is a tumorless, I definitely, looks like if this is like the more than five millimeters, it would be a carcinoma tumor. So this is uh, less than two, this is about two millimeters, so this is a carcinoma tumor. So if you see this, you see once in a while, you see this like, you know, lobectomy specimens or, you know, like, you know, wedge biopsies for intestinal diseases. Sometimes occasionally you see this and you call, you know, uh, you know uh, tumorless, carcinoma tumorless and move on. It's not malignant. I, they don't grow to form carcinoma. They just they can they can grow, but unless they are over five millimeters, you don't call cancer. That's you know. So I guess we have malignant tumor cells in our body. Unless they become large, you don't call malignant, right? Same thing with atypical, you know, adenomatous hyperplasia, right? If it is more than five millimeters, you call adenocarcinoma situ. You, you know, you can have a little you know grow, growth there in your lungs. Other tumors, hamartoma. Hamartoma can be a uh, it's a lot of times you don't need biopsy for hematomas because this is a kind of radiological diagnosis. You see coin lesion, well circumscribed lesion. Sometimes you can have see car lesion there. Lymphangial hematosis, the kind of typical classic word questions for your pulmonary. I'm not going to talk much about it. Inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, these are benign tumors. Hematomas are coin lesions, incidental findings, well circumscribed. Solitary at the periphery, less than four centimeters, consistent of stromal and epithelial cells. Epithelial, like the almost like airways kind of cells, and then stromal cells can just usually have cartilage and so forth. So this is this is long hematoma. Benign, just benign. You see cartilage here, benign like a glands here. So uh, you really, you know, if you if you know that if you have a diagnosis of hematoma, you really don't have to do anything. That's benign. 
lymphangial lymphomatosis. This is a kind of a good medical questions for your boards. You know this entity, young woman, childbearing age, for instance, perivascular epithelial cells, right? It looks like epithelial cells. These are positive melanocytic markers, HMB45, okay, melanocytic markers, positive for smooth muscle markers. And they'll ask you this, uh, you know, loss of function mutations in the tumor suppression genes, uh, TSC genes, two genes. This kind of a typical board question. Dyspnea, spontaneous pneumothorax, transplantation is, you know, if the patient is really bad, the only way to treat these patients are transplant. Inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, big term, it's inflammatory, myofibro, like muscle fibers and fibroblast tumors, that also called inflammatory pseudotumors, plasma cell granulomas, and these are misnomers. Usually seen in young patients with fever, cough, chest pain, and hemoptosis. Uh, it can grow, grow up to 10 centimeters in size. Uh, under microscopy, you see like a plasma cells, lymphocytes. In other words, inflammatory cells and a fibroblast. Poor prognostic factors. These are like, you know, classified under benign tumors. Poor prognostic factors are large tumors. Uh, if they metastasize to other areas or, or they have a lot of necrosis, metal figures, and so forth. Metastatic disease to the lungs are quite common. Uh, lungs are the most common sites. Uh, lymphatic blood uh, with our direct extensions uh, from the you know breast cancers over there from you know uh, GI tract pancreatic cancers and so forth. Uh, cannonball lesions, if you see like that, it's mostly uh, metastatic disease to the lung. Advanced lung tumors, uh, you know, adrenal glands are fifty-five times are a positive. A liver can be involved. Bone, brain can be seen. Know your couple of syndromes, Lambert, Eaton, Mass, and Gravis syndromes, um, and Super Vinicavis syndrome. I get a call 5 o'clock uh, Friday, 3 o'clock, and say that I need to diagnose this patient. Patient has Super Vinicavis syndrome. So then I tell them to take a small cell or something that they treat the patient right away. Owner syndrome, Lambert, Eaton syndrome, and Mass, Paraneoplastic, usually with the small cell carcinomas, due to autoantibodies to neural calcium channels. It doesn't respond to anticholinesterases like it responds to mass necrosis. Uh, you see weakness of proximal legs and arms. In the systemic uh, disease, superior vena cava syndrome, that neoplasm or tumors that invade or compress the superior vena cava, lymphoma or lung cancers, venous congestions, a dusky head and arm, and edema. You should have a, a circulatory compromise. Order syndrome is on the, on the same side, ptosis, um, meiosis, and hydrosis. Same side of the lesions, usually with the pancreas tumor, and the tumors are on the tip of the lung. A couple of uh, things about pleura, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So, as you know, prior pleura is on the chest wall, the superior lining, the visceral. Um, the tumors of the pleura, you can have primary or secondary. Secondary tumors more common, right, from the lung, that is studied to the from from the lung, or from the breast. Um, if you have a fluid, you always send it to cytology. We can do a million diagnosis in cytology. I rarely make a diagnosis. I hardly make a diagnosis of a malignant mesothelioma in cytology. I've done one time that is this year, and uh, it is wild-looking mesothelial cells in the pleural fluid. I call it and went to like the case went to Cleveland Clinic and they said highly suspicious for malignant mesothelioma. So you want to get a malignant diagnosis of pleural fluid, you need tissue invasion, right? Get to that. Solitary fibrous tumor. This is actually quite common. This is based on the pleural. Pleura, these are benign tumors, also known as benign mesothelioma. Don't use that term. Don't use the term as benign mesothelioma. It can be small to large, always a visceral pleura. Usually no pleural effusion, rarely malignant. So this is benign diagnosis. You see world's reticulin and collagen. You see spindle cells, rarely malignant. This is a solitary fibrous tumor. This is what it looks like in solitary fibrous tumor. Make sure this is not a malignant mesothelioma. That's a main difference in diagnosis. Standing wise, solitary fibrous tumors stand for CD34, which is kind of a marker. Keratin is negative, whereas malignant mesothelioma, keratin is positive, also stands for carotene, which is a mesothelial marker. So, a few words on malignant mesothelioma, and then we'll stop. Malignant mesothelioma, plural, pericardial, any you know, cavities lined by you know, the viscous organs have a mesothelial cells, right? Like a scrotal sac is going to have a mesothelial cells lining. You know, peritoneal cavities are lined by mesothelial cells. The tumors arising from mesothelial cells called mesothelioma. Um, in a malignant mesothelioma of the lungs, usually 
in the 60s and 70s, the book said, for the 60s, more of the 60s and 70s, these patients have lapsed into, you know, history of working in the mines or, or you know, you know, um, on asbestos exposure, yeah, so forth. Usually, water questions in malignant mesothelium are not associated with smoking. It's a trick question. Don't, don't that as a diagnosis. Uh, dire diagnosis. If you make a diagnosis of malignant mesothelium, a patient has about a year to two years to live. One of my colleagues, one of my mentors were sued because um, he called malignant mesothelium a certain histological type, and, and they say it was a different type, and actually, kind of, you know, treatment is lost. But anyway, you know, patients will try to find any way to kind of pursue you. So a presentation, sort of breath, unilateral chest pain. Pleuritic chest pain is when they have a pain when you're breathing. That's pleuritic chest pain. Patients can present with a flu-like illnesses. X-rays show uh, pleural effusions, usually massive. Asbestos exposure is very important. There's mainly two types of fibers in asbestos, amphib amphibole and acrisitol. Acrisitol are curved fibers. Amphibole are little short fibers. Amphibole are much worse because these little short fibers go deep into the lung, and these are more fibrogenic. Other etiology include inflammation, such as TB, empyema, and so forth. Radiations can is also kind of a risk factor for malignant mesothelioma. They talk about semen virus, SP40 viruses for malignant mesothelioma. Big number of malignant mesothelioma have no obvious cause, idiopathic. Know this? Picture, this is so-called a dumbbell-shaped fiber, a lucent center, and, you know, like a protein material, multinuclear giant cells. Uh, this is so-called asbestos fiber. And if you do iron stain, it stains for iron, right? It stains for iron. When it stains for iron, it's called ferruginous bodies, iron-containing bodies, ferruginous bodies. Confluent gray, white uh, nodular patches, usually lower lungs or at the diaphragm. And invasive thoracic structures, oral fusion. This is plaques that are not malignant mesothelioma. This is malignant mesothelioma. See the pleura? These are pleura very thin. It's pretty thick, about a centimeter. Right there, there's invasion, grossly invasive carcinoma. So you will see invasive carcinoma, either grossly or microscopically, to call it a malignant mesothelioma. There's only two types of histological types epithelioid type, sacramentoid type. The main reason we try to classify these tumors into different histological types is because of the behavioral. The sacramental type or spindle cell type are much worse than epithelial type. But it means telium by itself are really bad tumors, right? If they have one to two years. If you have sacramental type, it's even worse. Most common type epithelial uh, mesothelioma. These are not epithelial epithelioid. They look like epithelial cells, epithelioid. These are from mesothelial cells. Is an epithelioid, uh, you know, malignant mesothelioma. They look like gland in some areas, so sometimes they are confused by the consumers. So make sure you know that you know you have malignant mesothelioma differential diagnosis. If I have if my different diagnosis is adenocarcinoma versus malignant, malignant mesothelioma, I can do adenocarcinoma marker, which is TGF1, right? Adenocarcinoma marker. For malignant mesothelioma, I have retinin, calretinin. Remember that? Calretinin is positive in malignant mesothelioma. Invasive tumor invades into the stroma. Sacramentoid, spindle cell, fascicle, storyform areas. I'm always scared to miss a desmoplastic variant of malignant mesothelium. Sometimes when there's pleural fibros fibrosis, you got a thickened pleural fibrosis, uh, I want to make sure that it's not uh, you know, malignant mesothelium. I use the carotene. This is what a spindle cell or sacramentoid malignant mesothelium looks like. And electromicroscopy wise, there's a long, bushy villi, long bitted villi. Before the advent of immunized chemistry, you could do like it's hard to tell whether something was adenocarcinoma or malignant mesothelioma. You could do an EM. EM would show this elongated villi. We had a case here like about five, six, seven years ago. I sent it to University of Washington, I think Seattle area to kind of differentiate this based on the EM. Because, you know, we got different answers from clinical clinic and all that stuff. So malignant mesothelioma versus adenocarcinoma. Carotenin is positive, malignant mesothelioma, and adenocarcinoma TTF1 is positive. CA can also be positive. Long microvilli in malignant mesothelioma, short or absence of microvilli. Treatment is, you know, really, you know, great treatment may improve prognosis, um, but usually the patients do it very poorly. So any questions? So that's kind of a synopsis of a lung, two lectures. 
last well, in a couple of months ago and today. So that's to cover everything in, in a long tumors. So next time we have lectures, we'll do two hour series of non well, non neoplastic lung disease, or more like a interest of lung disease. And after that, I can show you some interesting cases. I guess the cytology, you know, those things will be in the wars, or infectious etiologies like the herpes, fungus, and so forth. I know the boards, you know, last board, somebody told me there's a question on um, either acid visualis or something like that. So, and they had like the structures, actually, uh, morphology. So, that, that might be helpful for you guys. Okay. Okay.